So from Kikos to Rio, so uh, as you may know, I had a career in doing AAA, and I decided to drop it all. So let me go here, ta -da, ta -da. open. So <coughs> this is me uh, like uh, almost four years ago, like that. And uh, I had a career at Electronic cars doing AAA games, and they were paying me really well. I have a really good salary. I travel around the world. I have a, a development team. I have an R&D team. I was having a blast, and then, but still, I was not happy at all. I was, I was like, how can I have all this power and not be happy? <clears throat> and then one of the, so there was a friend of mine who was doing a, her master's degree. And then uh, his professor asked her, uh, in order for you to finish your master's degree, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. And I went like, oh, well, that's great. I had never asked my question, what am I doing in games? <clears throat> and then I started going back to my childhood, and I remember when I was playing Mario. And I was playing Mario, and I was working on it like for hours and hours to defeat Bouncer. And then I left my controller in the floor, and then I come back to my reality and I had an alcoholic father. And nothing that I did in Mario helped me to cope with my life. In fact, it was detrimental to it. I was like, I got really angry at video games because suddenly they were not, they were not helping me. So I said to myself, I'm gonna go out to create a game for that wounded child that I was, to, uh, to actually help them to, to, cope with their, to, to, to cope with those situations. <clears throat> and then um, I started thinking, what am I doing AAA games? These games are not helping at all of all those people who are in need. So I decided to go indie. So, but when I decided to go indie, I wanted to do something that it was a bit different. It is, I didn't want to go by myself and a couple of guys to do a game. I, I, I knew how to do AAA, I knew how to create big games, I knew how to do uh, third person, mechanics and all that, and I didn't want to stop doing that. I wanted to do meaning like big triple, big indie games. And that's a challenge, it's still a challenge today, so <clears throat> I turned to movies and started looking at the movie business. So here on, we have a, a studio movie, and we have an indie movie here. Yes. Also on the left, this is a movie with uh, Rocky and Schwarzenegger, what was the name? The Expandables. You guys remember that one? Really terrible movie. <laughs> and on the side you have, uh, you know which one the one on the side? The Heart Locker. The Heart Locker. So both movies treat the topic of uh, war from a different point of view. <clears throat> uh, the Expandable is about the heroism. I go there, I sacrifice myself for my family and for my country. And the other guy is this guy trying to disarm bombs in Iraq. Why he's doing that? Why the, the motivation of these two guys being in war is completely different. And then I really love the, the hard locker because it gives you an insight of why is someone in that crazy situation. It gives you an insight of how they were thinking. It was not just a, a propaganda. It was actually making you question and say, I want to do this type of games. So I went through a little exercise and I took these two, oops, I took these two movies and I compared them uh, in terms of uh, box office, uh, no, budget, box office, and uh, Oscars. So uh, the expandable cost $80 million to make. They make $280 million, the box office. So they make 3.4 times their money and they got zero Oscar because it was a terrible film. And then <clears throat> you go to see The Hard Locker, it cost $15 million, it makes 50, and uh, they make 3.3 times their money. And it goes six Oscars because it's an amazing film. So we're like, wait a second, if this is happening in the indie side of, of, of films, I'm sure we can make this happen in the indie side of games. I don't think indie side has to be 2D <clears throat> pixelated. I love pixel and I respect it, but pixel, it is, uh, it, it's not accessible to many people. 
my mother will see a pixel game and she goes like, I don't get it. But uh, if I let her walk in the streets of Grand Theft Auto, she'll be like, oh, I know where I am. I know how, how she, she'll be connected to the world a lot easier. So I decided to go and do this type of indie games. So Papo Job cost 1.5 million. I got a, uh, it was a bit of funding from uh, the Canadian government, from Sony, and money from our pockets. <coughs> so, going outside to make a, a high budget indie games, I, I got confronted to a little challenge, and it's like producers. <coughs> because when you're dealing with budgets about $1 million, you need a producer. And then uh, there's a difference between producers. So I got confronted in Montreal to pitch my game to producer, game, producers coming from game, and also to producers coming from indie film. And it's completely a different world. So they both have something in common that is really cool. It is that uh, they are both there to find money to make products. The difference is what do you expect after your product come out? These guys, the game producer on the side, they think of profit. They want money. They're Steve Jobs wannabes. And they usually, if they get money, what they do is they're going to buy themselves a Porsche if they don't already have one. And that's what they want. On the right, uh, <clears throat> indie film producers, if they get money, the first thing they'll find is a cottage in the woods to go reflect on life. And I'm going to put a bit. Of water there. <clears throat> so it's a completely different stuff. So uh, it's kind of uh, the corporate values uh, versus uh, corporate. Oh, sorry. The corporate values versus uh, uh, independent values. And when I came out with Papo, I got there, I left TA, and I started doing my, my little prototype. And I went to game producer. They went, they freak out. It's like, you cannot do this game. He says, no, no, you cannot talk about alcoholism. You cannot do. It's stupid, don't do it. And, 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 and when I went to my partners now that come from indie film productions, I went to the, I meet them, say, I want to do a game about my childhood, my alcoholic father. I said, oh, good, let's talk about it. And then we start talking about alcoholism and the impact on society and how to live it and, and all the aspects of, of the storytelling and, and that one. And I went, wow, this feels really good. What is not happening over there? So I decided to partner with people coming from uh, indie film. And I think that uh, it's something that we need now. There are not that many producers, or any that I know, that are interested in doing <coughs> indie films. And one of the, re one of the, the cool things about when you're, um, my partners, they do document a lot of documentaries, they care about the product, they care about how the product impacts society. And that is, it's really different from, 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 from a guy from this side. Now, <clears throat> let's go to Army of Two. You guys know the, uh, have you played Army of Two? Do you know about Army of Two? Okay, so, <clears throat> Army of Two is a third person shooter game that is co-op game, so suddenly you have to uh, protect your body, so suddenly you cannot let your body behind, you have to help him to go, um, to go through war. And uh, what happened with that game is that, uh, let me, Bring you here. Uh, what does uh, Blue Eyes, uh, A Beautiful Girl, and the World have to do with Army of Two? Thank you. So what these things have in common is that you may not know this, but uh, when I was a kid, we have really big satellite antennas in Colombia. And we were capturing the signals coming from every US TV channel. So when I was a kid, I was, it's me in my bed with my big eyes watching TV until three o'clock in the morning every day. And then uh, I woke up in the morning, I go look myself in the mirror and then ask myself, I don't have blue eyes. Am I gonna get the girl? It was terrible. It was really, really, really bad. And, and, and I don't think that you guys do it in, 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 in as, uh, as a, you're not pouring Caucasian heroes all around just to make your content an imperialistic way to go into another country. I don't think that, or some people might. <clears throat> but what happens, they have a huge impact on, 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 
on uh, the people playing this content. So suddenly when I was at EA and I was actually deciding the content that I was gonna be giving to all these people, I remember being at the table surrounded by Caucasian people designing the two heroes. And the two heroes were supposed to be two Caucasian guys. And I say, if you do a game with two Caucasian guys, I leave this fucking team. You need to put an immigrant. And then we got into this huge fight and I convinced them. So suddenly, this is uh, finally, this is Tyson. So we have uh, Tyson Rios in the back. It's, uh, you don't know where he comes from. He could come from anywhere. He's a bit darker, and we have our blue eye hero. So <laughs> <laughs> they both live together. <laughs> so that was my first uh, win that I have at, at, at Electronic Arts, shaping the culture, and I felt really, really, really proud about that one. So the next one it is uh, the tampon story. So I want to start the tampon story about Army of Two. I never told that one before in public. So. <clears throat> This is the tampon story. So if your body got wounded, you have to go and heal him by sticking a tampon on him. Where does this, where, like, how did this crazy thing happen? So I wanna tell you how it happened. So again, <laughs> a guy in a skull. Let me draw something really. My father was killed when I was 16. He got shot in the head. And uh, it's a really horrible experience to live that one. And you're always guilty thinking that you hope you could save him, even if he was an asshole. I always wanted to save him. <clears throat> and so then I was in Army of Two, and uh, I wanted to do a game about healing people. I wanted to save my father. So I, one weekend I went in a we have the discussion about the healing mechanics and then I said, no, I have to do something about healing. So I did a prototype. Remember the human body product that they took someone and they sliced it in little pieces? So I took all those scans and I mixed it into a, a kind of an x-ray machine that you can scan your body looking for wounds. And then uh, I touched a few frames where the bullet stuck in his lung. And then this guy, Pass the, the mechanic was you pass the scanner machine, just analyze the body. It was really carnal, really visceral. And then when you find the bullet, you pull out scissors to take out the bullet out of the lungs. And can you believe we were in a room like this and I'm pitching the, 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 the healing mechanic to all the team? They freak out. They were like, they didn't know what to do. It was when I finished to show the prototype, they, they, they stayed quiet for a few minutes. They didn't know how to react to it. <clears throat> and then uh, they got it, they understood it. And the meeting ended up without a conclusion. It's in, it's out, how are we doing? It was, they felt so comfortable, but they felt that it was important. And then a few days later, uh, the producer come to me and say, you know, Vander, we cannot put that healing mechanic in the game because it's not authentic, these are mercenaries, and mercenary doesn't carry medical equipment, so then we're not gonna put it. So he diplomatically found a way to cut my healing mechanic. And uh, I said, okay, makes sense. So what am I gonna do? And then we have mercenaries coming uh, from uh, a mercenary, an American mercenary, a real one, guys who are working uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Colombia, crazy type of dude. It, it took us a while to find this guy. And then uh, we brought him to the office and this guy, he came, into our, he came inside a room and he never gave his back to the door. It was like a cat, like that. It, it was really, really scary. And then I asked him, so what happened if you get shot, if your body gets shot and you're in, you're in the field? And the guy told me, look, if the bullet goes through your arm and pierces through your arm and it doesn't break a bone or it doesn't break a lung or something, uh, we just stick out a female tampon and stick it in. And I'm like, oh my God, I have these motherfuckers. So, <laughs> because it's authentic, that's what they do. They carry, you see these big guys in the weapon, they have carry female tampons with them. So I, again, uh, it was pitching, so every Friday we pitch a mechanic, so I got there, I got with my prototype and then this prototype, uh, I tried to do more, uh, more accurate, more, more, more authentic. And then, uh, okay, you got the guy lying down, he got shot in the, in the leg, so I go there, and you just take out a female tampon and you put it in, in, in the leg, and then you had to 
do you had to find the hole and stick it. So it was it was really really it was a beautiful prototype. And then all the cats again like <laughs> they didn't know how to react, they didn't know what to do. And then uh, we went to another meeting the next day. And we're in a meeting and I remember this art director, an English guy. He said, uh, <clears throat> this mechanic is stupid, we should not put it in the game. You know what? Men should only be penetrated by bullets. And I'm like, oh my God, these people are crazy. <laughs> They're nuts. So what I did, I came out of the room and I went to a pharmacy. I bought a box of female tampon and I go to the reception and I go, you know those little machines that print stickers? And I, I print stickers, men should only be penetrated by bullets. And I put those stickers in each one of the tampons. And I went back to the meeting and <laughs> throw it on the table and give one to every person in the meeting. And you know, men were really uncomfortable with female sexuality. And then this guy had there and suddenly in the head was going, blood, sex, violence, mixing all, healing people, mixing all this together. And they were all confused, but at the same time, uh, people started laughing. And when they laugh, I put the mechanic in. And I won that war. And uh, <clears throat> that's what happened in the game. Unfortunately, we had to take the mechanic out. This is the only picture I find, because it was, uh, because we had to take it out of the game. And we had to take it out, not because he was not a, a good mechanic. We got a lot of articles talking about, uh, about this. Uh, in the game, it was because uh, it's a violent game. You get shot every time. So when you do it once, it's fun because they explain the mechanic, it's a joke, it's a body cup game. You laugh, you do it two times, three times, but when you have to do it 300 times, you say, oh, fuck it, this is bullshit. So we have to pull it out, and we didn't have enough, to, we didn't have enough time to put it like a few times. We were just rushing, we had to chip the game out, and we, we, need, we need to start cutting. So we put a lot of effort making this mechanic into the game, and suddenly, okay, what much extra work do we have to put in, in order to tune this to get into the game? Can we afford it? Not, so cut it. So it was pretty sad that, 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 that we cut it at the end, but it got pretty far. It got, <clears throat> it got really, really, really far, and, and, and I love it. I, lo I love working at EA. You, you don't hear the stories, but I was doing so much crazy prototyping inside EA. And what I did is it created a space for me to go there and play with any topic I wanted and with every crazy stuff I, w uh, I wanted. And, and, and it was a, a way, like, coming from a violent country and having lost my father to violence and seeing violence around me, uh, they led me explore that through the game. And I'm thankful and I'm thankful and thankful and thankful to them for allowing me to do this. And uh, I, I, got, I got it really well when I was there. So moving from uh, uh, <coughs> from Rios to Kiko. So suddenly <coughs> doing really violent games to do again another type of emotional violence game on the side, but in a way that is more accessible to people. So the story of Papoyo. So first thing I want to do in Papoyo is break the character development. So character development in game is so broken today. It's so much crap. Because you start, and then uh, what happens here? You get, you get a, uh, a gun. You move forward. You get some shields. You move forward. You get a bigger weapon. And this is what happens to you. So you start like something. And then, OK. Uh, you get first, uh, okay, the head. You get a bazooka arm, like something like that. Then you get a helmet. Let's put the Robocop helmet. And then you start getting, a, okay, you get your sniper rifle, carry it, then you get your bazooka in the back. And of course, you get another weapon and here you're carrying and your. And then you start looking stupid, something like that. It's just a shielded person against the world. And we don't solve problems like that in real life at all. Real life is not like that. In real life, it's like if I'm talking to my wife and then I tell my wife, the moment I have a gun in my hand, you will understand what I meant. Just slap me and it will never go anywhere. So what I wanted to do with Papoyo, I wanted to completely erase that and change the character development mechanic we have right now. So what I did, it started with a kid in his uh, school uniform and 
If slowly, slowly as you were progressing with time, you become weaker and weaker and weaker. You start losing a piece of your cloth. So you start with it, you, you lose your blazer, you lose your shirt, you lose your, uh, your shoes, and at the end, you're just almost naked. And uh, people felt that the character was getting weaker and weaker as you progress through the story. He was not, it was the same mechanics. But people assumed that he was getting weaker. <coughs> To the, point of, to the point that actually we brought it to such a this point of weakness that you were willing to hear, to be open to the story, for, for example. Like, and I think that I found this moment really crucial if you can bring someone into a game there. For example, like <clears throat> if I go and I'm fighting with my wife and, and I go back and I'll tell her, look, honey, when I come back from work and you don't recognize all the effort that I do for the family, it hurt me. What I did there, I just opened my heart and said, I'm vulnerable to what you have to say to me. I'm vulnerable to your judgment, so please help me here. So in, when you do that, suddenly you go like, everything. You, you open yourself and you're, you're, you're able to connect to the other ones instead of being shielded. So I think I managed to bring people to that moment in the, in, in the game to be up in a way. So I hope more games do it like that. <clears throat> so I had this really funny... Uh, analogy of how we make games in the AAA side. So we separate story from core mechanics, it's completely separate. So certainly I'm gonna do a $50 million game, okay? So, well, okay, to make your, your money back, you have to do a first person shooter for sure. Otherwise you cannot make your money back. Then let's add some inventory here so you can have some progression. Let's add some uh, driving, boom, $45 million, gone. So then, okay, let's work on the story. So on the story side, okay, let's try to do a really meaningful story. Like, so the first thing is gonna happen, the, so you have the, the guy with his family and his kid uh, before he goes to war. And then you go, okay, we have, the, we have the scene, and then we go, okay, do we have any mechanic to make this an empathic, uh, an empathic system that you can go there and play with your kid or talk to your wife? No, we don't have the money. We already, did, we already spent it here. Okay, so put a cinematic. And then we move on. So then we go, okay, we're gonna send this guy to Iraq. And we put it in the plane, and in this, <coughs> in this scene, he's, you're gonna be hearing the, him with his buddies and his team talking in the plane. The goal of this scene is to see who's with him, who's his rival, how does he fit in the team. And again, do we have any... Uh, dialogue mechanics like, I don't know, Mass Effect or something like that. No, we already spent it all here. Okay, so try another cinematic. And finally we get to Iraq and we put, uh, uh, we put our hero here and then we put a uh, suspected terrorist in the other side of the street. And then it was, uh, do we have any integration mechanics like uh, L.A. Noir? or something like that. No, oh, of course he was a terrorist. Let's shoot the shit out of these people. And that's how we do triple games. And you start there and then you keep going and you keep shooting people and you keep shooting people until you finish the game. And uh, it's, this is a comedic interpretation of how we develop triple A. But I've tested this with multiple other studios and people say, yes, that's more or less what we do. <coughs> so, uh, there's other thing that we have, the game bit chart. You guys know the concept? So it is kind of a bit chart that you plot out the emotional journey you want to have uh, in the game that comes from movies. And then every game is trying to do that. What is the emotional journey we're gonna bring these people to, 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 to do it? And then uh, we go there and we create this emotional chart, one guy to feel like this here, like this here, and he's gonna be his emotional journey. And then what happened is this how, how that bit chart is actually happen when you test the game. You go like, and those highs and peaks, those highs and lows, they don't come from the story. They come from the challenge of the level and the mechanic. These levels are a bit more challenging in consequence, I was more stressed and all that, but you don't feel that emotional chart that, 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 that we plotted at the beginning. And I've seen happen this in many games. And then, uh, well, what had, so they have this emotional chart also, like I heard a story from Naughty Dog, they have this emotional chart for Uncharted, and I look at it and it's like, this is bullshit, I didn't feel like that. 
so then, but then when I finished Papo, some, there was something really cool happened because when I finished Papo, yo, uh, <coughs> the programmer the, of, of my team, Julian, he came to me and said, Vander, you know what I like about Papo, yo? That you actually felt the emotional arc. And I'm like, it's true. This is the first time we were able to bring someone to the emotions that we plotted in the, in, in the arc and say, oh, wow. That works. And then how we did it. So <clears throat> I, think it, I see that the, 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 the first thing, it is like when you have your, your emotional chart, it, you have to mix it with mechanics. It, it is empathy through interaction. For example, like uh, in movies, uh, you can kill a character in the first 10 minutes and you can develop all the movie about the death of that person. In games, no, you can. How many games have you played that then introduces your character, you're supposed to have empathy for them, a couple of missions, and then he died, and you go like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna find someone else, and keep going. <laughs> <coughs> so suddenly, you, we need time to, to, to create these bonds, and I learned that from Michael. I really care about the princess, because I spent a lot of time with her. So suddenly in the game, so first, first choices that we did in Papua is like, you're gonna spend a lot of time with the monster. Like it's, all the game is about the being with the monster. And, <clears throat> and then on that one, so I, I, I think there's two points in the game that I find interesting. So it, first is, is modeling the mechanic of, uh, of based on real life. So suddenly when my father, when my father was, uh, he was a good guy when he was not drunk. A bit scary, but not, not dangerous. And then uh, when uh, he got drunk with alcohol, Let's put here frogs. He went crazy. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then you had to have the rotten fruit. And then uh, he come uh, to make him throw up the frog and come back to normal. And there was, uh, I don't remember the name of the, of the journalist who wrote about it. He wrote about the Papo Yo, and she was mentioning about the, she said something really difficult about the rotten fruit, that her mother was an alcoholic. And when uh, she associated the rotten fruit by holding the hair of her mother while she was throwing in the toilet. And that was fucking heavy. And it was, but, but what happened is that in a, in a metaphorical way, people felt, people felt all this. And the mechanics were there to support it out through, to, to support it out through the game. And uh, <clears throat> that's something we don't do. We don't model the mechanics around the story at all. In fact, we have um, one mechanic and we model the story around the mechanic. <coughs> and for example, as much as I like Assassin's Creed, I like the first one because uh, you're exploring, you're un understanding the relationship between all these cultures and religions coming together and then you say, uh, you're an assassin, you have to kill this evil guy and then you go and kill him. And you're okay, good, that's okay, I, I know where I am. And then you have to kill another one and you have to kill another one. And then Assassin's Creed became this game about killing everyone. And then you just became an assassin, and, 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 and there were no other mechanics to explore Enzi or, he, or his character inside. They just stay there, and, and I think that was something that is bringing, the, is bringing the, 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 their IP down, because it, they were not able to manage how to expand that, 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 that deepness that they got. <clears throat> and then the other one that I think that is, it was really important, it is uh, the closure, the, the ending of the game. We are really bad at doing ending in games. <clears throat> and the reason that we suck at doing ending in games is like, uh, okay, there's a really interesting number. Is 30% of the people, in average, 30% of the people finish their games. Assassin's Creed and other games get a bit higher, but only 30% of the people finish their game. Why do they finish, so many few people finish their games? It's because we know we're gonna get nothing at the end. Just a, you go there, you play a bit, you figure out the mechanics, and why don't you play it until the end and you're gonna play something else? There's no, so imagine if, uh, how badly we're treating our medium that it, it, it's, like, it's like you have a library at home filled with books that you play three chapters, that you have just read three chapters. That's pathetic. I think that by not giving closure and giving good ends to the game, I think we're actually hurting our medium because only our medium becomes just little. It's not different than Angry Bird. <clears throat> and then, and then, uh, so when we ended up, uh, when uh, we sold the game to Sony, we supposed, okay, the ending is gonna be a boss fight. You have a kid, you have an evil monster, boss fight. 
And then uh, that's how we planned the game. So when we were almost three months before chipping Papo, I was feeling so bad about ending it like that because I, I was betraying the kid that I was. That kid that I was could not have defeated his father by fighting him back. So I went like, no, man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then I took the biggest risk I could take with the project, and I went there, and, and I completely changed the last act of the game, three months before shipping. And I went there, and I sit down for two weeks, and I prototyped every single mechanic until the end. And uh, what I did, it is <clears throat> I took uh, all my years uh, in psychoanalytic therapy, and I tried to put it all there. So one thing where you're dealing with alcoholism is that uh, it's a secret. Alcoholism is a secret. People don't want to talk about it. A kid doesn't go to school and sit down next to his little buddies and tell him, hey, my father arrived drunk yesterday night. They don't do that. We don't do that. I didn't do that. Because it's a, it's a taboo. It's, it's a secret. So the first thing you have to do is, is stop the denial. Stop the denial. And the way that I did that, it was in the game when you get to the with the status, when you get to, to when Kiko, so first, uh, stop the denial, it is in, in Papo just first, uh, you get to the top, and, with, and throughout the game, you think there's a cure for monster. In reality, there's not a cure for addiction. If you follow an addictive, if you try to cure an addictive person, you're gonna go down with them. There's no cure. The only way that an addict, an addict can get cured if he wants to get cured. And that is the hardest part. So suddenly, Stop the denial. So when you get to the statue and you're hoping that the shaman is going to have an answer for you, the shaman tells Kiko, the shaman does not exist. Here, there's only you and your memories. And then people go like, what the fuck? And then when you start rotating the statues, the statues start transforming from the game fantasy into the real fantasy. So there we have one that uh, uh, Kiko, uh, monster is running after Kiko. And if you rotate the statue, you see Kiko in the floor and his father with a belt. And you go like, oh, fuck, this is a real game. This is someone's real life. And when I did that, I put a break on everyone's. It was like, wow, this is someone's real life. This is real. This is real. This is real. And suddenly, this is not a fantasy. This is real. And it was really important to do that because uh, when you're seeing a I remember once when I was, uh, uh, I was watching a, a video of about a, a therapist dealing with addiction, and this guy was stepping in front of, of, of the crowd and saying, I'm a surviving of an alcoholic father. And I was like, oh my god. He opened it. He said it. He said it. And it gave me so much power and desire to change stuff. That's what I did. I put that break there, and people go like, so people who were playing the game and they come from addictive families, they say, oh, okay, good. They can talk about it. Good, I can move on. The second one is after is, it is the negotiation. In the negotiation side, it is <clears throat> you have uh, to see what good and what bad did, the, did, 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 did this person have. And then uh, in, I created these little mechanics where, where suddenly you're, you're like, throwing battles of, you see the monster, he's in a nice state, and then you, so the monster is far away, you cannot access him, and then you press a button and boom, a bottle of whiskey come out here, and you throw it to, the, to a little tube, and in the other tube, a frog come out, and then you have to give him, like, I don't know, like six bottles of whiskey until the monster gets drunk, get furious, the house in the back are turning on fire, and he falls down, and then you have to bring him somewhere else, and. <laughs> but, and, and, and then there's a mechanic that you take little dolls there of Alejandra, you throw them to the tube, and in the other side you see this uh, uh, little doll transform into a real girl running around, and the monster rah, go and eat the girl, and you say, like, this game is terrible. This thing is like, it's really, really horrible game. It's really violent. So sorry, I wanted to people to step back and see this as a game so they can actually go there and and dissociate from the experience and actually get to a step of negotiation. So we bring them to the end and to the, to the final stage is uh, letting go. The only way that uh, you'll be able to go on with your life and live a decent life it is 
letting go an abusive relationship, like when related to alcohol, it's even more difficult. So when you get there, suddenly the monster was terrible, then you get here, the game was terrible, and then we bring you back inside this plate, and the monster is nice, and the monster is like, he, he goes there, he goes to sleep, he's sleeping, we have the sunset, we have grass, butterflies, all this beautiful setting, and the monster is on a bed. And the only thing you can do in that level is take the bed and throw the monster into the Avis. It's, it's a tornado sucking everything. So that part, it was like, I got so many, so many people wrote about the ending of Papa on the article because it was that moment of letting go. It was, people were expecting, a, like in the boss fight, you expect to defeat and like punching him and everything. No, this is the most passive way. You throw, you let go monster. You kill monster, you let him go. Just by pushing him while he was sleeping calmly. And that is like, really uh, twisted, but so something that is really cool about Papo is that even a year and a half after it came out, right now we're still receiving letters. At the beginning it was two, three a week. Right now we're receiving one every month, every, or two months. And, <coughs> and it's people, all of people thanking us for doing this game, and that is something that I never, never experienced. Uh, it working the AAA, so I have the picture of this guy here. Well, let me see, where is it? Uh, a fan of us who he tattooed Papo in his arm. He said that he really wanted a tattoo of Papo and then uh, one of the concept art did a tattoo, he, uh, he sent it back and he put his tattoo in Papo and it was really amazing to see that this guy wanted to mark himself because he said like, I'm the son of an alcoholic father and I want a tattoo to remind me that I had to be a good father. And that thing was like, it was so, I sent this to my family and they were like, oh no, <laughs> because it's really cool to, to see transforming something terrible into something good that can help people. And that's the beauty of doing independent games that have meaning. So what is next for us? So what we're doing, we're doing a game named Silent Enemy. It's about bullying. And uh, this game, uh, we're gonna change the name, so. <laughs> <clears throat> what happened here is like we finished Papo and we got money from the Canadian government to do an Aboriginal title. And then uh, Ruben, the design director, came and said, uh, man, we cannot, do it was a hunt survival hunting game. And then uh, uh, Ruben said, came to me and said, Look, man, we cannot do, after doing Papo, we cannot do a survival hunting game. We have to do an emotional game. And I told him, dude, I can't. Like, I already expressed, I spread my guts like, the last year I cannot do it again. If you have a story, I help you. And he said, hey, I've been bullied. I've been bullied and I have nightmares about bullying. And we're like, I help you to do that again. And then through the past year, we spent a lot of time going through his story and trying to decompose his story into mechanics in, in, in ways that I wanna tell the that I wanna tell the story. So I wanna show you one that is still like work in progress, but can I get the feeling out of it? Okay because uh, the crow, the evil guys, have taken away springtime away. Uh, the spirit of springtime, so now it's permanent winter forever, and you're trying to bring the springtime back. And right now you're just collecting spirits, and then uh, you'll be able, with the spirit, you'll be able to freeze back, and, and That is not the important part. The important part is this one. Okay, so right now here you're gonna meet the crow, the bully. Real microtransaction. If you don't give us three bucks, we're gonna be the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what happens when you sign not to pay.
<laughs> so through the, all of the game, you're gonna go being terrorized by these assholes. And then and this is just a little example of, of a mechanic that we're exploring. <coughs> but what we wanna do is gonna bring into this journey and exploring the topic of, bu of being bullied. And there's something really important about being bullied that we all of us have been in three categories when bullying. Either you're a spectator, you're the victim, or you're the guy who commit the bullying. And we move through those roles in our lives. If you go back to your childhood, you'll remember that you play one of these roles at the end at some time. And then when I bring you to this journey that you're gonna you're gonna go there experience the being bullied and then uh, transform into a bully and then we want to be bring you closure like we did with Papoyo. I still don't know if we're gonna manage to do it, like we did like like give you that deep closure. But I think that uh, uh, it's a really healthy space to explore and game design and and and, uh, and, and it is for example and I hate when uh, I hate when people call this serious game. This is not a serious game at all. This is entertainment, like just like a good book. It's like when you go to rent a drama and they, at the start you don't, you don't go see, hey, I'm gonna watch a serious movie. No, it's just, it was a, you just look at drama. And, and I think that it's important that we, that, that, that we don't categorize games who wanna deal with emotion as serious because it's bad for us, it's bad for the industry, it's bad for everyone. I finish. <laughs>